And uh, I usually just tell people to call me what they call me at home, Gabu. Let's say it for Gabu. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go ahead and set this up. And while I do this, let me just uh, get signal here. I want to compliment my co-author, Irvin Andre, for his wonderful presentation. Indeed, what Irvin has done is that he has given us the opportunity to understand what dignity, what purpose, what studied effort really means. But before going into detail as I, I pull up this PowerPoint, on behalf of Poncasti Press, I really want to thank Eva who reached out to us first. Eva is up there. Eva, wave your hands so everybody can see you. A round of applause for Eva Jersey of the University of Toronto Library System. And Jeff Newman and Brenda Regis, my former student at the grammar school, the Dornbrook Grammar School, he's not present. So I, I wanted to just take a moment to present Operation Upload. Operation Upload really is that project that Eva called us about. How the University of Toronto, in its desire to be the most imminent global digital library, which it is, it was important to get a series of voices and that they thought it worthy that the work of Pan Cassie Press be uploaded so that persons everywhere, free of charge even, free of charge, would be able on their cell phones, your laptops, your computers, understand, appreciate, and get access to Dominican history. So this really is an opportunity on this PowerPoint to talk about what were the five foundations of our success. Five foundations. Family commitment to education, progressive public policy rooted in inclusivity, that's courtesy of people like the father of Eustace LeBlanc who's here, someone who came from humble origins in Vegas, Dominica, was an agriculture officer, became chief minister. The first thing he did was to try to open the doors of higher education. Let's hear it for Edward Oliver de Blas, ladies and gentlemen. A third, a, a third foundational piece was studied effort. Irvin and I, as youngsters at the Rosa Public Library, we stayed long hours. He did that also at John Hopkins, before that University of West Indies in Jamaica, where he studied history. And we did it again at the Library of Congress. When he was in Baltimore at John Hopkins, he'd come down to, America, to our DC and we'd spend long hours, so we engaged in studied effort. We also had something that allowed us to succeed. It's something that oftentimes we miss in human relations, and that was we had a meaningful friendship. What is a meaningful friendship? So I earn a living as a trial lawyer. I do both civil and criminal litigation. And a lot of times when I represent young people, or people who are not so young anymore, who are in trouble, is because they've associated with folks in a fashion that's not meaningful. What do I mean? Well, if you associate with someone who's industrious, that's meaningful. If you associate with someone who's involved in writing, in scientific endeavor, in enterprise, that's meaningful. If you associate with people who are gang members, who are drug dealers, who beat their wives, and who steal, that's not meaningful. And so oftentimes it's the little choices we make in the phrase that we choose to garland our lives with that makes a huge difference. And so I was very fortunate. Irving, I want to thank you for being a meaningful friend. Let's hear it for meaningful friendship. It is a <laughs> Fifth and finally, a patriotic commitment to nation building. We come from a small island of Dominica. We attained a certain degree, we attained a certain degree of education. What was our duty? What was our duty? Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I humbly suggest the duty that we decided to embrace was that we had a commitment to return to the source, to return to the well from which we drank from our tender years and replenish the pool. It is unselfish duty that builds great civilizations. So let's hear it, brothers and sisters, for your sense of duty, community and country. Well, we all had a start, and right here is the family in which I had the honor of being born. It's my father. He was the younger brother of Katie Christian, who was over here, his father, Henkel Christian. 
they were about education. He had served in the British Army with the father of Kathy and Trevor Bertrand. Twistleton Bertrand, who many Dominicans know, they were in the same unit. C Company, Windward Islands Battalion, South Caribbean Forces, British Army, during World War II. But he'd been a member of the London Book Club in the 1930s, and he'd used the library before I was born. My mother had been a pupil teacher, she's one right, she's 93, she's holding on, and she was a member of the 4-H Club. And she tells us that during the war, when the German submarines were sinking ships, they couldn't get salt in. They had to go get seawater and make salt with it. They couldn't get cloth in. They had to take flower bags, and flour shipped from places like Canada, and wash the flower bags and make clothing with. They couldn't import sugar, and the sugar on island was not sufficient. So they had to grow cane and squeeze the cane to make the syrup with. On and on and on. And during that time, she taught school as well. So I had two parents who were very fixated on education, and that provided the basis. So parents, all I say, if you have a home, make it be a home that is full of books. Because it is by reading, I put it this way, readers ultimately become leaders. So those who read, are those who lead. And so that family foundation was very important. I'll go right on. Our father was a dearest. November 22nd, 1963, John F. Kennedy shot in Washington. His death stuns the world. November 23rd, 1963, I wept for President Kennedy. Every single day from the end of the war, our father kept a daily diary. And so this is one of his diaries. It's 1965. He starts every diary with a prayer. This is, the Lord is my shepherd. And he says, SPCK Bookshop. Anybody remembers the SPCK Bookshop? Yes. Let's hear it for the SPCK Bookshop, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. And what is he doing? He writes down there, SPCK Bookshop, student companion. Anybody remembers the student companion? Yes. Amen. Schilling arithmetic. Yes. Anybody remembers pen, shilling, and... Pence, shillings, and pounds. And then, fundamentals of English. Why is that there? In the days before the rise of social democracy and people like Leblanc and Byron before him an opportunity, most Dominican men and women could not get to high school. Very few got to high school. Our father didn't get to high school. And like Irving's father, he was determined that we got to high school. So what did he do? He bought these three books, and in the afternoons after the Rosa Meeks Infant School was over, we would have to go to the fire station where he presided as a fire officer. And he gave us lessons. And in a 1967 diary note, he writes, quote, lessons this afternoon in reading, writing, and arithmetic. Esther, my sister, seems to be very bright but Gabriel is a dunce. <laughs> Esther went on to do uh, very well. She became a certified public accountant. As for me, I'm not to show how I'm doing. <laughs> so he was meticulous in keeping records, and that also helped me. This is our mother. I met Emma Harris, and I told her that her brother, Errol Harris, did the eulogy for Dr. Christian, my oldest brother. Dr. Wilson Christian was the first African-descended and Dominican born chief veterinary officer. He got a scholarship in Dara Gandhi in India, studied in, in, in India, and in Florida, but he died in my hands at age 37. Wow. Irving, thank you, sent me $100 in an envelope <laughs> as his brotherly, meaningful friendship support. Thank you, Irving. And my mother started writing. She came up to be with him, a memoir of the days in St. Joseph, the war years, the years when Dominicans of color were pretty much still slaves. They were slaves. Slavery supposedly ended in, 19, in 1833. Slavery was abolished. But in the plantation economy, the reason the Labour Party actually came into office